you know, we did this little mini-series on prayer here each of the Sundays in January, and now we're getting back into the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, so in, we've entitled this kind of overarching series, Church Matters. And so we're going to come back into, uh, um, speaking of sarcasm, <laughs> we're, we're jumping right back into chapter 4, where we are, you are going to hear the Apostle Paul speak some biblical sarcasm, all right? Um, and so if you weren't sure what sarcasm was, an ironic or satirical remark tempered by humor, mainly people use it to say the opposite of what's true to make someone look or feel foolish. <laughs> if you're not our skilled in this art, let me give you some examples, <laughs> all right? When a sister faces her sloppy brother, she might say, I love those mustard stains on your oversized hoodie. They really bring out the color in your eyes. You know? Or when something bad happens, sometimes we say, that's just what I needed today, right? Which we don't really mean that. Um, or uh, uh, when, when, a, when a roommate is acting bizarre, uh, someone might say sarcastically, is it time for your medication or mine? You know? Um, all right, I better stop right there. Uh, you get the idea. Uh, now, Paul's sarcasm has a point and purpose to it, okay? And just to remind us kind of what's happened before this in the first few chapters is that Paul has been addressing this topic of pride, uh, and they're, they're, um, the, the Corinthian church, the believers there, were very proud of their spiritual experiences they had and the gifts that they were experiencing that God had given them and they were just thought they were all that. And uh, they also took pride in some of their Bible teachers, you know, saying, you know, I am a Paul, I'm a Paulus, you know, hey, my guy is greater than your guy, uh, you know, better, better speaker, more charismatic, blah, 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 right? Um, so, so there was this pride that the Corinthian church had. And so this is one of the issues Paul's been addressing, and he's really kind of bringing this topic to a close before he gets to some other things. And there's really uh, a lot of topics that Paul covers in this book. And so, uh, so he's kind of bringing this, this topic of pride to a close. But um, let's read these few verses here together. Um, as is our habit here at Darby Creek, let's stand, if you're able to, uh, for the reading of God's Word, just uh, out of respect for God's Word and in honor of it. And I'll, I'll just read this. Listen, listen with me here. Uh, so this is 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to 13. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we are we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our hands. When reviled we bless, when persecuted we endure, when slandered we entreat, we have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. This is God's word. Please have a seat. You see the sarcasm in there? We are fools, you're wise, we're weak, you're strong, and he's just... He's just really pointing out, uh, um, it really as kind of like a father would say, uh, or a parent would say to their child, he's saying, listen, you're way off, guys, you're way off. And uh, he's going to speak some um, words of correction to them. And the first thing, uh, so I'm just calling this message deflating pride. I'm sure none of us have an issue with this. So you can just take a break right now. That's sarcasm. Okay, all right, so no, we all have some level of pride in our lives, okay? We all have issues that we are, uh, where we're prideful in, and so I think there's some takeaway for any one of us today, um, so let me, let me just pray as we get into this passage, okay, and ask for God's help. 
Lord, we come to you this morning. And uh, help us, Lord, to, to walk in humility before you, first and foremost, but also before one another. Uh, Lord, uh, I pray also that you would help us to just think clearly this morning. Help us, Lord, that if we're distracted, we'd hear your word uh, unhindered. And also, Lord, just help us to be in our hearts in a posture of receiving what it is you have for us today. And Lord, I just pray, pray for me. Lord, help me to communicate in a way that's glorifying to you and is, and is just true to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're talking about deflating pride here. This is what Paul's trying to do. And what's interesting here is, uh, we'll, we're just going to start off in verse 7. And uh, in verse 7, he, he really talks about some prayerful attitudes. Oh, it's prayerful. <laughs> Prideful attitudes. Prideful attitudes. I'm being humbled right now. Prideful attitudes uh, that need to be addressed. And this first prideful attitude is, uh, I'm more important than you. I'm more important than you. And that's personally a, a wrong way of thinking, a very prideful way of thinking. And what's going to happen here is in verse 7, the Apostle Paul asks three questions, lickety-split, like this. Boom, 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 okay? And they're, they're like rhetorical questions. He's trying to make a big point here. And, um, you know, Jesus was a great, uh, uh, had great questions for people, right? When, he, when he, he got to the heart of the matter through questions a lot of times, and the Apostle Paul really uh, does this too here with these questions. You know, think about how many times a question asked in the right way at the right time really changed the course of things. Um, I, I just happened to see this uh, or heard about this the other day. So in 1983, in April, around April time frame, Steve Jobs was trying to get the CEO of Pepsi to come on over to Apple, okay? John Scully, some of you may remember this, right? Uh, trying to get the, the, the CEO of Pepsi to come over to Apple to help him be the new CEO of Apple. And, uh, you know, there was this back and forth between them, trying, and, and uh, John was like, well, uh, you know, I don't, know, I don't know if the pay package is right, and there's talking about money and all this. And here's the question that Steve Jobs asked John Scully that changed his thinking to making saying, I'm going to go to Apple. Here's the question. Steve Jobs asks this, he says, do you want to sell sugar water all your life, or do you want to come with me and change the world? And, and uh, John Scully says, in a, in a book, he said, I don't have an answer to that question. He's like, wow, okay, yeah. Sell Pepsi, change the world, you know? Uh, and, and so it, it was just interesting how that question changed the trajectory of his career, right? And uh, more important than that, these three questions, right, that Paul has... Uh, that he's going to ask are way more important, but really have quite an impact. If you take a look there uh, in the passage, right, and he asks these questions in verse 7, he says, for who sees anything different in you? That's the first question. He's basically saying, well, who made you mother superior? Right? I mean, that, that idea of who's, who says you're superior to us, that you could judge us? Um, and, and so, you know, and then another way you could look at that question where he's, when he says, um, when, he, when he says, for who sees anything different in you? In other words, what makes you so special could be another way to look at that, right? Um, but really to fit in with the idea of judging, um, because right comes before this is this, that they were kind of pronouncing judgment on who's a better uh, apostle or what does a real apostle look like, right? Uh, and so to, do, to fit in with that, I think really it's probably more of like, well, who made you judge over all of us? How are you different than anybody else? Right? So that's, that's the first question. And, um, and so I suppose you could say, well, God's the one that makes me different than anybody else. Now, that's true. He made me. Uh, he made me different from you. And, you, and, you know, and some of you say, hey, thank God for that, uh, that you're different from me or that we're different from each other. And that's a good thing. But uh, I think the idea here, though, is that he's saying, you know, it's God who has given you your abilities and your skills and anything you have. It's God. In fact, the other questions he asks here in verse 7 reveal this, where he says, the next question, what did you have that you did not receive? In other words, you know, all those spiritual gifts that you're all so proud of there in Corinth, 
uh, these speaking gifts and so on, that you're so, and you've had these wonderful spiritual experiences, he's saying, well, well, who gave those to you? Where did they come from? You know, you didn't conjure those up. He's saying God is the source of all of that. So you have no basis for pride. You have no reason to say, look at us, right? Or any, any uh, standing to judge someone uh, else. And, and when you think about this, this whole idea of these, these uh, prideful attitudes, uh, really what we ought to be saying here is all true ministry comes from God. You know, they were kind of saying, well, hey, you apostles, you guys, you know, you don't really seem like the, the authentic deal because of how things are going in your life. You know, your life really sucks right now. You guys are suffering and all this. And how can that be a display of the power of God? That's, that's how they were viewing it, okay? Um, but humility says all true ministry comes from God. What I have comes from God, so how can I be proud of my gifts, abilities, and etc.? cetera? Um, uh, so this is just, it's just a good reminder, right, to, to, to try to uh, pursue humility in our lives. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not sitting in judgment over other people's ministry that God's called them to. And, you know, we got to leg that up to God. Now, yes, there's truth and error and there's wrong doctrine and all that stuff. But when, a lot of times, though, we, we're not judging that. We're judging how, the form of the ministry or something, the form that it takes or whether this is really a valuable thing or not. And that's not for us to judge. Uh, he's saying, no, we got to leave that up to God. And, uh, and God is working through all kinds of people in all kinds of ways, right? Um, and I got to say, I would say, uh, you know, 25 years ago, when I first started, uh, we first started the church, there's this, you know, and this is this probably youthful um, pride, you, you kind of think, well, you're doing it the right way. You know, you're going to do it the right way, you know? Or when you're raising your kids, by golly, I'm doing it right. You're not, you know? Yeah, and until you realize you're, you don't know what you're doing, right? <laughs> okay? I mean, it just... Just that, that, that kind of thinking was just, just wrong. This is prideful. You know, there's all kinds of ways to do ministry. There's, God's doing different things in different families, so I can't, you know, I might want to try to help them, or, you know, we might want to try to help one, other, one another with our parenting and this and that and the other. But, um, you know, there's, we have to, really, the most important thing we could do before we kind of even move into helping, if, we, if that's what we want to do, help one another, is we need to, do some really good listening first because there's a story going on there, right? There's a story happening and uh, the chances are you don't know the story. You don't know the backstory. You don't know this. You don't know that, right? And so before we can uh, help, that's what ministry is, kind of helping one another and, uh, and helping others in Jesus' name, right? And for the furtherance of the gospel and the kingdom, right? Is that we need to get in there and, and be involved with uh, one another's lives and that takes humility it takes, uh, you know, shutting the pie hole, doing some listing uh, so that we can understand what's going on, right? Um, I don't know how many times I've gotten in trouble with Linda because I spoke before I listened, right? Uh, and that, that's not on Linda, that's on me, right? Or you know how guys, I'll pick on the guys for a second, you know, sometimes we're, we're talking to our significant other and we're like ready to finish the sentence and then we'll even do it. And, and Linda will be like, that wasn't what I was gonna say, you know? You, you missed it. Can I finish, please? You know, and it's, that's my fault. Okay, I'm sure nobody else has done this but me. Okay, but, but that's pride, really. Part of that's pride. Part of that's just impatience, right? Uh, but just listening and entering in to what's going on, right? And so that's really uh, part of learning to, uh, to what it means to be, you know, to grow in humility, right? And this is, you know... Uh, Nobody likes to sign up for the course on humility, right? Because uh, it's often fraught with painful lessons, isn't it? Um, but uh, this, is, this is how we grow. This is how we grow. Um, take a look in your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. While we're going there, so the, the, you know, the thing here is you've got to remember is that how can we be proud if we realize everything we have is from God? Every ability we have, right, uh, comes from the Lord. And so go to Romans chapter 12. And we'll go to verse, uh, I think it's 3. He 
He says, um, the Apostle Paul again, uh, speaking to a, a different audience here, a different church, says, for by grace, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a challenge to all of us. You know, we think we know ourselves pretty well. And we might know to a certain degree, but those that we spend the most time with know us even better, right? Uh, my wife knows my blind spots better than anybody, okay? She knows all the weaknesses, all right? And so we need to have an honest assessment of ourselves. And um, one time, Linda was pointing something out to me that was not, uh, that, that I was doing. Well, I'll just be honest with you. She said I was being short with her, that I was uh, coming across kind of quick to the, I was kind of had a quick fuse. And uh, everything in me said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. What are you talking about? You know, and I can laugh at that now, but it was very hurtful to her for me to say, no, you're not. No, I'm not. In other words, you're a liar. That's what I was saying, right? And, uh, and you know, I, and sometimes I still do that so where I like, you know, I'm in denial. You know, I'm in denial, Ohio, and it's, we're not talking opioids. And I'm not saying that to make light of the opioid epidemic because that's terrible. But I'm just saying we get in this denial thing because we think, no, you know, we know ourselves better. We need to have an honest assessment of ourselves, and sometimes that's going to come not from looking in the mirror but from someone else looking at us who loves us and says something to us and we need to receive it and be open to the possibility that we have no idea of what's, what's going on, how we're acting, what we're doing. We're blind to it. And part of humility is, and by the grace of God, we need to enter in and say, well, okay, maybe you're right. Maybe we need to, I need to explore this. I need to look into this, you know, uh, and getting some help or whatever it might be. Um, and so that, but that's hard, and that takes the grace of God, because every bone in our flesh wants to say, "I'm right, you're wrong, you're crazy, whatever, blah blah blah." But um, that's not the way of humility, is it? And the way of following Jesus is the way of humility. <laughs> How many of you, anybody seen uh, that show, The Mandalorian? This is the way. This is the way. All right, this is the, these, uh, if, so the Mandalorian's kind of offshoot on one of the Star Wars things. Um, Star Wars, uh, um, these, these bounty hunters. And I'm, I'm just, uh, you don't have to know anything about it other than this, is that when they have a code, basically, right? One of, the, one of the pieces of code is that they never take their helmet off for anybody, okay? Never, right? Never, nobody ever sees them without their helmet on, okay? Uh, and they say, this is the way. This is how it goes. When you're a Mandalorian, that's how it is. I tell you, this is the way when it comes to following Jesus. Humility. That's how we're going to grow. That's how we're going to become more like Jesus. Pride is not going to be the way, okay? Pride is not going to be the way. And so, so as Paul tells us there in Romans 12, 3, we need to have an honest assessment of ourselves, okay? We need to see. There are things there that we might not uh, actually be able to evaluate ourselves honestly with. Now, let me uh, share with you. This is from Paul Tripp. He has several things he mentioned, four common factors that contribute to a distorted view of self. And I'm just going to list them off real quick. Uh, so four common factors that contribute to a distorted view of self. Knowledge. Knowledge, I mean, knowledge is great, all right? Growing in our understanding and in information, but it can be a source of pride. Paul says here, as many have said, knowledge is power and it's true. The more you know, the more you can accomplish, but knowledge must never be confused with true faith because you can be very knowledgeable and very immature at the same time, right? You can know everything there is to know about your product or industry and know very little about the Lord and your own need for grace. When knowledgeable people look in the mirror, they're tempted to see someone with a great powerful brain that rarely needs help, but the mirror of God's word reveals that, they, that we have a deceitful and desperately sick heart that needs daily rescue, right? Uh, that's a good word. 
Knowledge is good. I mean, it's good to grow in our information, but by golly, we've got to realize that can also be a source of pride, okay? I, see, I, I live in the academic world, too. I see that, right? Some of the most proud people can be people in academia, right? Um, and that's not saying everybody's like that, but we all have our, have our uh, strengths and weaknesses. Experience could be another thing. The more you experience, the more confidence you develop. Now, I had a, I'm going to share a story with you about this kind of thing, about how experience can, can cause pride and also, uh, in, in my case, uh, cause a wrong diagnosis of a car problem, okay? So uh, Linda's car, for a couple of months when I would start it, uh, when we would start it, for about three seconds, it would give this sputtering sound. I'm going to play it for you. Um, <laughs> I'm very proud of getting this recording, okay, because <laughs> let me just say, uh, you know, because I just knew, okay, what's the worst type of trouble uh, to troubleshoot? Electronics. Electronics and intermittent problems, <laughs> things that don't happen every time. Well, this didn't happen every time, but it happened like 80% of the time at least, okay? Now, I didn't take statistics on it, but <laughs> I'm telling you. So listen to this, okay? I'll put it by my mic so you can hear this. You hear that? For about three seconds, as soon as you start it, right? Okay, so I got my recording, right? Make my appointment. I go to unknown shop, okay? And, uh, and, I, go, and I go in there, and I go say, hey, you know, uh, this, it's making this sound. I've got a recording, by the way. And, uh, and the guy's, oh, I know what it is. No problem. We'll get you in and out of here. You know, it's the blah, blah, blah actuator or something. Valve actuator, blah, 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 okay? And I already looked it up online. That's, and I, said, I already knew what it was. I thought that's what it was. You know, because the, the internet does not lie. We know that. And so, uh, so I thought that's what it was. And, and he said, okay, yeah. We, I said, well, you sure you don't want to listen to this? Oh, yeah, we want to listen to that, okay? So um, he said, we are going to need it for, to, to, we are going to need to keep it, though, okay? Because uh, it only does it on a cold start, okay? So you have to let it sit for hours, right? So they, they shuttled me back here, which is really nice. Shuttled me back here. And, um, and so then the next morning, I get a phone call. that says, yeah, we can't get it to make that sound, but we did find something else that needed fixed, right? And I don't doubt that. I've never been cheated by these guys, uh, to my knowledge. And, uh, and I, I, I think they've been dealt honest with me, or else I wouldn't be going back. So I said, well, okay, yeah, that thing definitely needs fixed that you said. And I said... Um, I was like, you know, so I got off the phone, I was like, well, okay, so if you didn't hear what I'm hearing 80% of the time, it's not fixed, right? I mean, I knew that. You know, I'm not a technician, right? So anyway, I know this is a long story, but anyway, <laughs> but it had a grand impact on my life. Let me tell you what. Um, so, so, I, so after I told Lynn, I said, we weren't going to, we're going to go pick up your car, and I said, I got this plan. You know, I said, I want to talk to the technician, right? And so with the guy that worked in my car or on her car, and I just want to, I want to play the sound for him, you know, right, so I got, I, I went, I went, I went up to the receptionist desk, and I said, hey, could I, and I wasn't going to pay yet, I said, can I, can I, because they did fix something, right, so I said, can I talk to the technician that worked on our car, well, sure, you know, so out comes, I'll call him Bob, uh, who works the desk, is not the technician, right, they're like the buffer between you and the tech, yeah, you know, they're take they're the intake people. So Bob comes out and says, "Hey, I said, hey Bob, uh, I'd like to talk to the technician. I'd like to play the sound for you that I mentioned to you about, you know, to see if this is if he recognizes this because I think it's still going to be a problem." And so I got to say to his credit, he responded with humility, and and said, "Well, sure, come on back, you know." And we got to talk to the tech. Went to a a room that was quieter outside of the shop. Played the recording, the tech's like, oh, yeah, that's the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, the actuator thing or whatever. Yeah, he says, yeah, that's going to happen. It's going to happen again if we don't fix that. I said, well, that's what I was saying when I dropped it off, you know. But I said, I'm not going to be mean about it, but can we fix that? Can you just keep it because I'm going to be back? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I tell that story not just so I can vent, but to tell you guys, because I, I feel it's very cathartic up here. I feel a lot better now. Uh, that you know the injustice that was done now. No, anyway. But I got to say this, that, you know, the experience that they had 
was, uh, would not allow me to share my little old recording, right? And I suppose they probably thought, well, it's probably going to happen. But, you know, I already said it was only, it happens about 80% of the time, right? You know, so how many times are we going to have to wait day after day to start it up and see it doesn't happen? So, but, but that was clouding their ability to kind of have a little bit of input from somebody that doesn't know anything about cars, right? Um, and so we can do the same thing in other areas, right? Our experience, we can say, well, I don't have anything to, I don't have anything to learn here, right? Uh, and so on. Uh, and so we have to realize that, it, you know, our experience can sometimes be a source of pride, right? Another thing that Paul Tripp mentions is success, right? Success uh, can be uh, a wonderful blessing, but when sex- successful people look in the mirror, they're tempted to see someone who deserves all that they earned. But the mirror of God's word reveals that every good gift comes from the Father, it says in James chapter 1, verse 17. Last one I'll just mention here before we go on in our passage that Paul Tripp mentions is recognition. Praise and recognition of others is delightful to our ears because we selfishly love to be glorified and we're kept awake at night by the negative opinions of others Others have of us. I mean, I got to admit, you know, when somebody doesn't like me, I don't like that. And it bothers me. I'm sure it probably does many of you as well. Um, and so, but he says, it's not an evil thing to be spoken highly of Christians should strive uh, to the respect of others and of the church. But even if you are recognized, by others, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Remember what the Bible has to say about inner character and keep sober judgment. In other words, what's going on on the inside, what people don't see, just as important as things that people do see, you do, right? And so uh, it, those are just good things, I think, to be reminded of, things that uh, can cause us uh, to be proud and so on. Now, another thing that's mentioned here, uh, prideful attitudes in this, these verses in Corinthians is, uh, this this attitude where he says, you know, basically, I don't need anyone else. I don't need anyone else. And if you look at verse 8 there, let me go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Take a look at verse 8, where he says, already, again, being with the sarcasm here, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. In other words, oh yeah, you guys are going on with us. You don't need anybody. You've arrived, right? And, and that can happen with any one of us in our walk with Jesus, okay? Uh, and, and what we need to realize is that I've not arrived spiritually. I need to pursue spiritual growth and I need others to help me with that. In other words, we never arrive spiritually speaking. We're always to be on a growth path uh, pattern where we're pursuing um, matters of spiritual growth in our lives. And there are provisions, there are resources, if you will, that God has given us that promote that spiritual growth. We know that the Word of God, right, does that. As we take it in, it causes and helps us, as we take it in and apply it, it helps us grow, right? We also know God has provided the local church that we're in, the people here as a source of growth in our lives, right? To help us grow. Again, kind of hearkening back to those blind spots and, and, uh, and just being av- available to help and, and, and so on, and to help us grow, to come alongside, not as judging over, but to come alongside and help, right? And so um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 is a, is a good one to remind us of spiritual growth. You go there. Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Which by implication means he ain't done with me yet, right? He's not done with us. It's not about, you know, becoming a Christian and then just, oh, well, whatever after that. No, he's saying what should be happening is God has began a work in us when we receive Christ as Savior. He's continuing to work in us, but you know what? Guess what? You have to cooperate, <laughs> okay? You have to cooperate with God by putting yourself in a position of growth in those resources, you know, coming to worship, listening to God's word, being involved in these other lives, these other, again, uh, you know, uh, submitting to the promptings of the Spirit, all these ways that God uses to grow us, right? So we got to realize 
we have not arrived and we never will, spiritually speaking. So uh, you need to make sure you have a growth mindset, okay, that you, that you and I, we say, you know what, um, I, I, I always have things to learn, always have things to learn. And, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm perfect at this, but I like to learn things. I like to read things. I, list, I read a lot of books. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I, I like to listen to other people preach because I like to learn how they do things. Um, and and I, I like to learn how they break down a passage. I, I like, you know, that might sound like, you know, snoring material for you guys, but that's okay. Uh, you know, and just uh, things like that. I, I just like to learn that. And so, uh, and, I, and I think that's how God's wired me, but I think we all need to be a degree. We see a lot, realize we need to be pushing forward in our faith. We need to be pushing forward in our faith. And, and that's one of the reasons um, I hope that um, eventually, if you're not already, you will be involved in a small group in our church where you can be in, 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 in next to one another for the reasons I've mentioned here already today, right? Uh, that's a resource God's given you for growth. Uh, and, and maturity and all these things. And so, you know, and, and we, we've, Lynn and I have always been in a small group uh, in the church. And, it was, and, and I'm not, uh, you know, I, I've been in ones when I'm not leading, and, uh, and, I, and I would. And I think it's important for all of us to realize that's something that God wants us to do. 1 Timothy 4 7. 1 Timothy 4 7. I bet we've got some people in here that work out, okay, in various ways. Maybe you do it at home. Uh, maybe you do yoga. Maybe you do, I don't know what it is, all right? But maybe there's some people in here that work out. Um, think about spiritually working out, okay? Also, physical working out is good. Nothing wrong with that. We've got to take care of the bodies God's given us, right? But take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have nothing to do with uh, ir- irrelevant, or excuse me, irrelevant, <laughs> irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. Train yourselves for godliness. The Phillips translation says this about that verse. It says, take the time and the trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. I think that's an accurate idea of what that passage is saying. He says, listen, you got to train yourself spiritually. You know, um, and, and there's, there's value in, in, in taking care of our bodies, but even more so spiritually speaking, right? And so we need to realize that um, we have not arrived and we never will, right? And, and just to kind of harp on this, uh, this doing this life together and not in isolation, Guess where God does a lot of the growing in our lives? When you and I rub shoulders. When you and I live life together and things come up between us. Or, you know, God uses people almost more than anything else uh, to, to, um, to soften the rough edges of our lives, right? He really does. In 1 Timothy 1.5, he says, the goal of our instruction is love. Well, guess how we're going to learn to live out the instruction uh, and, it, and it come out in love? It's with each other, right? We can't do that in isolation. So we need others to grow. Hopefully we made that point abundantly clear here this morning. Last thing I want to mention here, verses 9 and 10, this prideful attitude we see is, I need to look good. In other words, it's about the appearances. It's about what people think of me that is important. And that's a prideful attitude. There's no question about it, right? And so where are we getting this from? Let's go back to uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4. Verses 9 and 10. And so Paul says, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all. Like men sentenced to death because we have become a a spectacle to the world. Uh, I don't have time to get into it. You guys should look up on that spectacle. He's getting at what something would happen in the Roman 
enter, what the Romans did for entertainment, okay? The, the, the spectacle, okay? Uh, but we don't have time to dive into that. But it's saying that he's saying, you know, uh, spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, uh, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. We are held, uh, you are held in honor, but we in disrepute, right? And so he's just going on. And, and, and then he tells about their situation, right? He tells their situation, verse 11, to the, uh, to the present uh, hour, we are hungry, we are hungry and we thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. Now he's not, this is not sarcasm. This is real. This was the real life for the apostle Paul. He's saying, and we labor, working with our hands. When reviled, we bless. People are making fun of them, right? Uh, when persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We've become and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Like dung. That's what he's saying. That's how other people see the apostles. Paul, right? And the Corinthians were buying into this talk of other people saying, you know, look at those guys. Like, they, that, that's not a God thing. These guys are going through all this. That's not power. You know, come on. You know, they're saying now that there's, there's, there's something better than that. And, and Paul's saying, uh, no, actually, that, this is the way. <laughs> that's what he's saying. This, this is often the way of someone following Jesus. They will sometimes be reviled. They will sometimes be made fun of. They will sometimes, people will look down on you. And so, you know, the, um, at times we will look weak to other people as we follow Jesus and do ministry in his name. But the fact of the matter is we don't need to be seen as honored by others, really. It matters what God thinks, doesn't it? Humility says true servants of Jesus are evaluated by who they serve, not by how they appear to others. In other words, in the grand evaluation, it doesn't matter what you think of me or what you see. It's about what he thinks, about what the Lord Jesus says, about what his evaluation is, and we can know what God values by getting into his word. We can know what he says he wants to see. And it usually starts right inside and then works itself out to the doing, right? I'll take a look at three verses real quick here um, that have to do with this aspect of appearances. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 2.4. 1 Thess 2.4. Oh, I'm in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. I was like, that is not the verse. <laughs> First Thessalonians 2, verse 4. But just as, as we, but just as we have been approved by God, again, kind of Paul coming out saying, you know, our ministry here has is, is been approved by God. But just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. He's, he's, he's putting on the emphasis. And God tests my heart. He knows my heart. We live our lives and we speak so as not to please people, but to do and speak as in such a way that it pleases God. Take a look at also at Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. Again, along this theme of uh, we are doing this, really, we are to live our lives really for an audience of one, the Lord. Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. He's not talking to people who are in full-time ministry. He's talking to people, you know, like most of us, just living our lives, got regular jobs. But we need to see that we need to do our jobs and live in such a way as we're working for the Lord. 
how we conduct ourselves, the things we say, the things we do when nobody's looking, right? With the company resources or whatever, that we know God, we're doing it for the Lord. And so that helps us realize um, it's not about appearances. It's not about what other people think. It's not putting on airs. not coming off super spiritual, talking ourselves up to come off good. Get real. That's really what we need to be, right? And so uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, uh, where he says, again, Last verse here on this whole topic of appearances. So whether we are at home or away, meaning um, at home with the Lord Jesus, right, or away from that, right? Um, Because he he was talking about, you know, to be, uh, when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord, all that, right? So um, whether we're at home or away, he says we make it our aim to please him. We make it our aim to please him. It doesn't matter. That's our goal, to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to Jesus, to be a husband, to be a wife, to be a student that is pleasing to the Lord. Right? How do you know what's pleasing to him? We got to get in the word. We got we to learn what it says. And we do that in community, I think. Is really, it's, 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 it's the safest place to get and learn what that is. Right? There's protection in learning in community too. We can, because it keeps us, it helps us in check if we go off some, some tangent, some you know wrong way of thinking, unbiblical way of thinking, and so on. Um, and so this is what it is. This is this is the way here, right here. So, um, you know, we, we all of this takes the grace of the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? Whew. There's so much pride left in me. You know, it, it rears its ugly head on a regular basis. Right? Um, uh, I just, I, you know, and, and let me just, this is a little stupid things. Like I, I was thinking, that, you know, um, Linda and I laugh about this now. It's all about Linda and I today. I'm sorry. It's, it's, a, it's what, a, what a ding dong my, I am sometimes. Um, is that, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, there will be a noise, right? Uh, outside. And I would, because, and this is really, this is just the real answer, because I don't want to get up and I don't want to deal with it. I'll say, it's just the neighbors, right? Until it's not, <laughs> right? And I laugh at that and we can laugh about it now, but you know what's the heart of that? It's pride. I don't want to do it. I want her to do it, you know? <laughs> and she does sometimes. <laughs> And, you know, and so I just say, you know, it's, we're, this is a constant battle. Amen. This, this is, until the Lord Jesus comes back, we will battle with pride. But let us not give up, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need your help, God. We need you. Uh, we, we help us, Lord, to see that we have never, we will never arrive in our spiritual growth. It's something to be pursued and something that will not be completed until the day you return. Help us, Lord, to just realize that it's not about appearances. It it matters what you think, what you see on the inside, what's really going on. Lord, help us to be more transparent with you and honest with you. Help us, Lord, to receive when others have things uh, input into our lives, when they're saying something is there, help us, Lord, to resist denial. Lord, give us the grace to receive it and say, well, maybe what you're saying is right or whatever. God, just help us to walk humbly before you, Lord. Help us to resist the desire to be people pleasers. It, uh, it hinders us so much in our progress, in our faith, Lord. Um, transform us, Lord. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you have not left us here uh, without the power 
to make progress in these years. You've given us your, your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to submit our will to your Spirit and let you have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.